Thank you. Thank you and welcome. I'm Father Mitch Packle. Welcome to EWTN Live, where we bring you guests from around the world. When we read Psalm 139, we see that the psalmist proclaims we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And it's amazing how the more we learn about science, the more we can learn how wonderfully we are made and how wonderful the whole universe is. Tonight, we'll discuss intelligent design in nature. And this is something that multiple scientific disciplines are showing to us. So, we'll ask the questions tonight. Does science point to the purpose and theology of creation? To the distinctiveness of human persons? And to God's grandeur? Here to tell us more about it is a retired senior fellow with the Discovery Institute for Science and Culture, who is also the author of a book called God's Grandeur, The Catholic Case for Intelligent Design. Please welcome Dr. Ann Gager. Dr. Gager, welcome. <coughs> it is Thank nice you. to have you with us. It's really wonderful to be here. And your book is actually a compilation of an essays by a number of folks in the sciences and philosophy, and philosophy mm -hmm. right? And theology, too. Yeah, we've got them in there, huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, first of all, would you tell us a little bit about what we mean by intelligent design? Okay. Intelligent design is the theory that certain things in the universe are best explained by an intelligent designer mm -hmm. rather than random mutation and natural selection. Now, this alternative, let, let's take a look at the second part. When you talk about random mutation, that is something that is held by people like Charles Darwin and others, correct? Yes. And what does this random mutation mean? Well, um, at various points in the cell cycle, mutations happen. They change the bases in the DNA. And where it happens is random. Um, when it happens is maybe pretty regular, but still it's sort of like radioactive decay where mm -hmm. you know that it's going to happen at a certain rate, but you don't know where. Okay. And it's not only something that some scientists apply to biology, but there are a number of scientists who would say that the very existence of, you know, stars, solar systems, galaxies, uh, and the organization of matter into the atomic table, the, the structure where the, the atoms all progress according to a certain development, mm -hmm. um, and that all of that itself is simply an accident of history. Mm. Well, that's kind of hard to accept, given uh, that... Well, it is, but that is their theory, yes, is it not? Uh -huh. And that everything is a random... That i just like to point out, there is one part of it that they don't believe is random. Namely, their statement of the theory that everything is random. Mm -hmm. They think that that's really true, mm -hmm. but everything else just happened by accident. You know, you're talking about the beginning of the universe, uh, mm -hmm. when the first atoms came together, the, um, the smallest parts of, of uh, atoms formed themselves into particular uh, atoms and then particular elements, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, all, and that um, the establishment of the constants, like the, uh, gravity and um, speed, of light. speed of light and uh, the m nuclear forces of attraction, all of that had to 
come into being. And um, they explain it as a series of laws that, mm -hmm. uh, that caused it, the mm -hmm. laws of nature. Right. But you can't have laws without a lawgiver. Yes. And um, the constants of the universe were set in such a way that it allows life to, to, take, to happen. And if they were changed in the slightest bit, um, life would be impossible. In fact, the development of stars and galaxies would be impossible as well. It's one of the amazing things that your book points out is, uh, first of all, creation really did have a beginning, mm -hmm. what scientists have nicknamed the Big Bang, mm -hmm. about 14, 14 billion, billion years, years mm -hmm. ago, so right, just right around there. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that wasn't even easy for scientists to accept, was it? No. Um, at the beginning of the 20th century, every scientist in cosmology accepted the universe as static. And they thought the universe was eternal. It never had a beginning. It just always was. Mm -hmm. And when um, the evidence started to point to the fact that um, there had been an explosion at the time uh, of the origin of the universe, um, and the uh, father, Georges Lemaitre, who's a priest, um, mm -hmm. came up with a theory of explaining how that happened in the creation of the universe, mm -hmm. um, they mocked him by calling it the Big Bang. Yes. And it was an Englishman that called it the Big Bang. Yes. It, to, to mock this theory. I think Fred, Fred Hoyle. Yes. And um, <laughs> then, um, I don't know, maybe 20, 30 years later, uh, some other physicists discovered there was a background radiation in the universe that they could detect um, at a very low level, and um, they decided that it had to be the background radiation left over from the Big Bang, mm -hmm. and that confirmed Lemaitre's theory, and um, they told him about it on his deathbed. Mm -hmm. So he got to hear that his theory was um, substantiated. Uh -huh. And, you know, he himself had to really, he really struggled, though he was using Einstein's research to demonstrate this Big Bang, that there's a curvature in space and everything is moving away from the center of the explosion, mm -hmm. like you would expect. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, uh, of course it is. And, you know, Einstein still had great trouble accepting it because he believed the universe was eternal. Eternal, yeah. And now, um, what the consequence of that is, a large number of cosmologists, not, well, some cosmologists became believers in God. Yes. Some of them went on to Christianity. Um, and I think that's a very astounding thing, that things do happen in the world, discoveries happen that are enough to convert scientists that and this is one of the points of your book that science is not in opposition to the faith I mean you yourself uh, are a convert mm -hmm. and you went through a process of conversion and many other scientists are doing the same uh -huh. they, because they see if there was a start when there was once nothing and then in another moment there was everything, you have to explain it with somebody, someone, not only making it, but designing it. Yeah, it's uh, not random. You can't have randomness establish laws. Mm -hmm. So I can tell you another story of a scientist who converted. Yeah, go ahead. Recently. His name is Gunter Beckley. He mm -hmm. is a German paleontologist. Mm -hmm. So that means he studies fossils. And um, he was supposed to set up a display in honor of um, Darwin's, I think, 150th 
writing of the book, um, Origin of Species. Mm -hmm. And he set out a display where he had a, um, a scale with Origin of Species on one side and Intelligent Design books on the other side, mm -hmm. a stack of them. And he had it like this. So Origin of the Species was supposed to be more weighty than the Intelligent Design books. He made one mistake. He yes. read those books and he became convinced and he contacted Discovery Institute um, on the down low, you might say, yes. <laughs> and uh, said, I'm, I'm, I'm beginning to think this is true. And we had long conversations with him. He finally uh, declared himself to be a proponent of intelligent design, and within a year, he lost his job. See, that's one of the risks, isn't it? Yeah. That science doesn't necessarily follow the science, does it? No. Um, Gunter was very perceptive. He read what was in intelligent design books, and then he looked at his own discipline and found that there were gaps between major groups of animals in their fossil record that couldn't be accounted for by intermediates. And so he realized there was something going on <clears throat> in the development of animals that indicated there was a jump. You go from one form to another rapidly, and you can't account for that by um, evolution, but you can account for it if there's a designer behind it. Yeah, part of Darwin's theory is that these changes took place slowly and that there, and he asserted that there would be these intermediate steps that would be discovered by paleontologists, another scientist. You would see how it goes slowly, slowly this way. And that's why you have the famous picture of a monkey, then an ape, and then an early hominid form, and then Homo sapiens upright. Mm -hmm. And that's a famous image, but that it hasn't happened quite that way, that it makes it seem these are all in line. That's a drawing that's a representation of how they'd like to think about it. Yes, yes, that, that's, that explains their theory more than it explains Reality. science. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And w w again, some of the points you, your book brings out is that there are certain basic structures in the cells and in the molecules making up the cells mm -hmm. that are extraordinarily complex and could not have step by step evolved. That's true. May I show you a video of a few of them? Yeah, the, the, how about the kinesine? Yeah, kinesin. Kinesin. Okay, so um, kinesin is a molecule that, uh, a protein that carries um, molecules, uh, or, uh, sorry, vesicles from one place in the cell to the other. They look like little walking men, and you can see them there in the picture. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> there are actually several of them there carrying that vesicle. And they walk like a human, one foot over the other. Now, now this isn't just some cartoon. This is this is a representation, a representation of how they actually mm -hmm. walk within. A lot of scientific work went into working this out, and it's just an amazing thing. It's just two different protein chains, and then at the top of the kinesin, at the end of that stalk. There's a fan-like structure, um, I don't know if we're going to see it again, where it's hooked to the vesicle that it's, it's uh, there at the top. You see that green fan-like yes. structure? Um, those are the light chains of kinesin, and they're what attach kinesin to whatever it's carrying. I worked on light chain uh, kinesin in my postdoctoral fellowship. Mm -hmm. So. Here's another example. Um, when they run into um, structures in the cell, like that network of um, microfilaments, they can get stuck. And so what happens is the kinesin, um, they recruit more kinesin um, to mm -hmm. work on this and pull together. And sometimes they recruit another 
molecular machine that will pull in the opposite direction. So they have a tug of war back and forth until they work it out. Amazing. And this is, this is not this little critter, um, you know, moving a cell. This is inside the cell. Mm -hmm. Inside the cell. And, you know, we could not possibly have known that until more recent uh, uh, research mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, better microscopes, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, incredible microscopes that mm -hmm. were impossible in the past. You know, if Darwin had been alive when we're here now, um, with knowing what we know now, I don't think he would have written the, uh, the Origin of Species. It would be impossible to believe. Yeah. He, he was looking at some, you know, at animals and the phenomena among various species that he discovered on uh, some islands off of uh, South America, in the Pacific side of South America. And he was trying to think through why are these sort of like animals, also, but they're different. And he's trying to explain that, but he's looking at very external type of uh, developments rather than these internal developments. Well, he thought of cells as being like blobs of jelly mm -hmm. without any structure inside. Mm -hmm. um, one other comment about Darwin, though. He was not entirely without a motive when he wrote Origin of Species. How so? He was trying to replace God with a... Uh, a theory that could serve the purpose of God, um, a scientific explanation for where things came from that would remove the need for a creator. Yes, which is somewhat odd because he had considered studying for the Anglican ministry. In fact, he was pushed that way by his family, I believe, but yeah. he ended up... Um, not going that route and trying to become a naturalist. Right. And this may have been as much, I mean, I'm psychologizing a bit here, but it could have been his way of avoiding working for God by saying, actually, the theory of random selection is takes the place of God, so I'll just work for that. Yeah. The sad thing is, by the end of his life, he had no pleasure in anything anymore. He did not enjoy music or poetry or any other kind of art. Um, he lost the taste for it at the end of his life. And I think that's partly because our appreciation of beauty is a gift from God. And our desire for truth and goodness and beauty are essential um, derivatives of God himself. He is yes. truth and beauty and goodness. Yeah, if you go back to people like Plato, uh, you begin to realize that the, the proof for the existence of the soul is our ability to know goodness and truth and uh, beauty. And if we can know what's good, true, and beautiful, and these are eternals, then we are created for something eternal. Mm -hmm. And that also is part of intelligent it design. Is. There's a chapter on it in the book. Yeah, exactly. Um, can I show you one more molecular machine? I would love to know something about ATP. Yeah, thin ATP synthase. Yeah. Synthase. So ATP is a molecule that um, is required in the cell to carry energy. It stores energy from chemical reactions that release energy, and then it's available to give energy to, um, to cells where they need it for more chemical reactions. Mm -hmm. It's like the cash in the cell. That okay. You can trade cash for some activity when you I need mean, it. All those little like follicle-like things are inside your cells. That's, well, actually inside mitochondria in your cells. Um, that see that turning um, wheel like thing. Yes. It it functions like a rotary motor. That's where the energy is coming from, and you see prot protons passing from the outside through the the ATP, and that's what causing the turning. 
And that turning then is propagated through a stalk down below where it um, has an uneven bump on it. And as the bump passes, it opens up different elements where the ATP comes in, ADP comes in, and it's charged with the phosphate, so it becomes ATP again. You use about eight, uh, your body weight of ATP every day. And so the body has to have a way to recharge ADP when it, when it comes. And this is the way it does it. There are, I don't know, uh, lots and lots on one mitochondrion, and your, each cell of yours has lots of mitochondria. And um, we need that energy. Now, here's the question. ATP is fundamental to a cell. You need ATP to get anything done in the cell. So from the beginning, there needed to be something like ATP. And you had to have some way of recharging it. This is a complicated structure. This is a machine operating like a machine. Um, and it, it's essential to life. Um, ATP is ubiquitous in life. So where did it come from? By design or by random processes? Mm -hmm. It would be, uh, I mean, that looks as complicated as a watch. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I don't think I could get a watch, simple, fairly simple, small little tool. I don't think I could get that by grabbing a lot of, a lot of metal ores and just keep tossing them around. Yeah. I don't think I'll get a watch out of that. Mm -hmm. No matter how many times I toss it around, I will never get a watch. Yep. And to say that our cells develop randomly when it has, you know, those two elements that are so complicated, what looks like guys walking and what looks like these machines. These rotary motors. Yeah, rotary motors inside every cell. Now, here's, so we see these complicated machines inside every cell. Um, there are more, and every single one of these are required for the cell to function. No one is optional. Well, I'm going to show you another that's actually... Is this the topo isomerase? Top, topo, topo isomerase, yes. Mm -hmm. um, you all, how many of you uh, remember uh, phone cords, uh, the old fashioned kind, like sort of like this? Yes. Um, yeah. Well, DNA is a coil like this. And what happens when it's replicated, when it's copied, is it's, it gets torque, it gets twisted up. So this machine is the one who resolves the twist. So here's how it goes. So that's still inside our cells. Mm -hmm. We have to have this in order for us to survive because um, if the <laughs> ATP gets too twisted, it breaks. Um, now, let me see if I can explain the process to you one more time. So. So we, we see this okay. twisting. All right. So there were two strands, and it, the machine cut one of them and held them apart, and the other strand went to, through to the bottom. Now it's sealing the two strands that were um, broken before, and it lets one out the bottom, and then there's another one it holds on to. It's like a to, crane. And lets one out at the top. So... Uh, we, let me, the analogy would be if you have a twisted rope, it's full of torque. If you cut one strand and allow them to separate, the tension would go away. Mm -hmm. And this is a machine. It's a complicated machine. And coordinating it uh, is really amazing. But we couldn't survive if we didn't have topoisomerase. So this is another machine. So they're inside... Each cell are this is this variety of machines. It's not just one machine. No, multiple, multiple. There was an issue of Scientific American um, back, I believe, in the 90s, where um, they put together a collection of molecular machines. 
they call them molecular machines mm -hmm. in, in the um, journal article. And there were so many different molecular machines that people are studying now. And yeah, it, life is full of it. And mm -hmm. um, all kinds of other regulatory processes that are amazing. Uh, the code of DNA is very sophisticated. It's not just coding for protein, it's also coding for where to start and when to stop um, and um, how to uh, regulate and, and coordinate changes in the in environment to receive signals from the outside to change what genes are made. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And all of this is something that, again, could not have just over uh, a, a few uh, millennia gradually developed. All of it has to be there at the same time mm -hmm. in order for a cell to exist. Yeah. Not, we're not talking about mm -hmm. a whole organism mm -hmm. composed of multiple cells, but for the first cells to exist, all that, and it's, it's like the constants of the universe. How can you possibly have this without a mind mm -hmm. thinking this mm -hmm. up, so, designing it, mm -hmm. and then knowing how to put it together? Exactly. So another... And replicate. <laughs> scientists now who work on origin of life are trying to find a way to get... Um, a nucleotide string to be act like an enzyme and replicate itself. Mm -hmm. And they're not having much luck. But this is at the at the core of how things would have to start. You first have to have a molecule that can hold information and then copy itself mm -hmm. to, you know, you go from one to two to four. Mm -hmm. um, but they haven't gotten that far. And um, so to put together a cell let me explain it this way. You need protein, you need DNA, and you need RNA. But you have to be able to copy the DNA, which requires many different proteins. And you have to be able to turn the DNA into RNA and into protein. And that requires many different proteins. So you have to have proteins to start the process. How do you get a protein? Well, you copy the information in the DNA, turn it into RNA, and then you need a, a molecular machine called a ribosome, which mm -hmm. is very complicated. Um, it's composed of many proteins and RNA. People who deciphered its structure won the Nobel Prize. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the ribosome is what turns the RNA into protein. Now, here's the puzzle. How do you get a protein? Where do you start? Yeah. Where do you start? Yeah. Um, do you start with the DNA? Well, you got to have proteins to get the DNA copied. So it, it, it's a circle. It's a causal circul circularity yeah. problem. And the cell is full of these kinds of conundrums. And they can be explained if you postulate an intelligent designer. We see this, the design in the system all the time. And, you know, he, this is something that's very important, and you make the, the point, uh, the, I forget which article it was, but this is not saying, well, we can't figure this out, so it must be God. No, it's not because there's a gap. There is such a clear design of the Big Bang and of the whole universe at the biggest level, but there's also design at the tiniest sub-cell level. Yeah. And that you are hard put to approach this without seeing someone with a mind greater than the universe is able to invent the macrocosm, the, the, the universe, and the tiny universe inside each cell. Mm -hmm. And 
we believe that it's the same one. It's not different designers. That all because the principles in the universe are necessary for the sub cell. Right. All of that is you know there's one designer for it all, and is just you know so overwhelmingly beautifully designed, and he made us with a mind who can, uh, in his image and likeness, to discover all this. In fact, that's another evidence for design that we discuss in the book. The fact that we can understand the universe is itself uh, amazing. Yeah. There's, if it's a random process, then why should we have developed into creatures that could understand the universe around them? Why is it that the universe is such that our planet is in a part of the universe where you can actually see the stars yeah. and our moon is the right size for uh, blocking the sun for an ecl eclipse and that's the start of a lot of uh, modern astronomy measuring the signals from um, the corona mm -hmm. of the sun mm -hmm. why um, why can why is this all together that there's Laws in the universe, laws in the cells and bodies, and human minds who can comprehend what that big mind has, that great mind has exactly. comprehended. And, and why do we want to know? Yeah. We've got this drive in us to learn. Um, that is a Judeo-Christian thing, um, the fact that we want to learn and we want to study nature so as to see God. Um, Romans 1 says we can perceive God in the greatness of his works. Um, we can, one, uh, Psalm 139, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Right, that's how it began. Um, the heavens proclaim the glory of God. All of this is part of our faith, mm -hmm. and, it, it, and it's resonant with science. I'm afraid we have to take a break right now, mm -hmm. but I, I think it's so important for us to see that these go together. If you want to get more information on intelligent design, you can do so by going online to intelligentdesign.org, intelligentdesign.org. It's a very helpful resource. We'll come back with some of your questions and comments, so please stay with us. Right, so we are discussing the book God's Grandeur, The Catholic Case for Intelligent, Intelligent Design, written by our guest tonight, Dr. Ann Gager. Uh, this book is available at EWTNRC.com, our religious catalog, and it is item number 86. Zero one eight six zero one, um, and I think you'll find it very helpful. The, the it's a variety of authors uh, dealing with a variety of topics, but it really holds together on this theme. We have a caller uh, coming in, Mike. You are calling from the Great Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. What can we do for you today? Yes, good evening, uh, Father Mitch and um, Dr. Gager. Uh, this is a question I've long thought about. I know the Catholic Church rejects Darwinism, but does it accept evolution with caveats and caution? Alfred Russell Wallace, who didn't discount the possibility of non-material origin of the human mental faculties, i.e. like the supernatural, mm -hmm. was a contemporary of Darwin along with Charles Lyell, but they later were critics of Darwin, I believe on random variation with credible arguments. 
Why did Wallace and Lyell lose out to Darwin's impact on the sciences, despite their scientific rational analysis? Thank you, Mike. Very good. Um, first of all, what about uh, Catholics, the Catholic Church's teaching about evolution? Um, Catholics are permitted to believe in evolution with a few restrictions, as he said. Mm -hmm. um, we're supposed to accept the creation of human beings as unique, um, and we have two first parents. Mm -hmm. um, oh, that is in contradiction to evolutionary theory, which says we had to come from 10,000, a population of 10,000. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's the only exception I can think of right now. Um, my view is that certainly some things in nature happen by natural selection. Mm -hmm. um, it's clear that things like antibiotic resistance happen by natural selection. Um, there are other processes, and there's examples of colobus monkeys who develop a new enzyme for di digesting new foods that they're eating. All, things like that do happen. Small-scale evolutionary processes do happen. Perfectly fine to accept that as a uh, True. Yes. Uh, but what's not acceptable, in my opinion, is this grand overarching scheme that says evolution explains everything. It doesn't. It, it, that, yeah, evolution can explain even the eyeball. No, it can't. You no, know, the, the structure of the eyeball, it, it's like the structure of the inside of the cell, is so complex, you, you can't explain it by... Uh, Darwin's kind of theory. Secondly, the creation of an immortal soul, this is not something that is a matter of evolution. God creates each human soul. Um, the animals have animal souls that are not immortal like ours. Uh, ours is a very distinctive cell. You can take a look. I, I, I like my cat. I've had dogs and stuff in the past. Uh, and, you know, after they're finished eating and playing, they just go take a nap. They never look up at the skies and say, hmm, the Milky Way. No, they can't do that. And they don't have any interest in it. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they just don't. So, we have an immortal soul capable of, of contemplating eternal truth. Yeah, the explanation for human exceptionalism can't be made by Darwin's theory or by mm -hmm. um, any other evolutionary theory. Mm -hmm. We have an immortal soul. We have consciousness. They have no explanation for that. We have a moral... Um, law that we have in, inside us. That's, there's no explanation for that, though they're trying. Um, our ability to speak, there's no explanation for how that arose. Yeah. Um, and certainly our ability to do things like write sonnets or compose symphonies or write poetry or do mathematical um, in, invent new mathematical theories. Um, these are all things that are distinctive about humans, and Darwin can't explain them. Um, a strictly um, random process can't account for them. The thing is, okay, those are all activities that are way, way beyond any animal activity. People will say, oh, there's speech in animals. Well, not at our level, not even close to our there, level. And, and to call it speech is using a human analog, an analogy from us to them. There's communication, but to say that it's speech is going a step too far. Mm -hmm. uh, the, you know, detecting grammar? Yeah. They don't have grammar. No, no, gra and grammar is, is very important, especially at a time in our culture where people ignore grammar. They, uh, you know, frankly, right now, 
people are using certain vulgar words for their punctuation. You know, they, that's just, if you've ever been on the New York subway, you know what I mean. And so this is, you know, something that uh, is going on. But we actually know good grammar. Every language has its own grammar. Mm -hmm. It's remarkable. But you, and it's the basis for logic. And it comes from logical thinking. Grammar teaches us to think logically. The animals don't do that. They have signals of emotion. Mm -hmm. but not grammar. Yeah. In the book, um, That Hideous Strength by C.S. Lewis, yes. there's a Wonderful scene book. where a bear is uh, expressing his emotions. He feels hunger. He feels um, a desire to be free. He escapes his cage. He's being directed by the wizard Merlin to go in and wipe out <laughs> a really nasty um, convention of people. Yes. And he feels this urge to kill. Yes. But he doesn't think, I need to go in there and kill. He doesn't think, OK, uh, to do this, I need to go in through this door, and I need to sneak through this place and get. Yeah, uh, nor would a bear be able to make a verdict in court. That person is guilty of a crime against humanity. I should eat them. They would never, a bear mm -hmm. would never do that. Mm -mm. They just go for the one that's slowest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let's, let's have another question from our studio audience. Ma'am, where are you from? Um, I'm from Florida, Punta Gorda, Florida. Uh, nice area over there. What can we do for you? Um, I was wondering with this information and having grandchildren, if, um, there is a way that this information can, information can be presented to uh, children in Catholic schools because I noticed in your videos how very dramatic they are and how I can compare them to my children's, uh, my grandchildren's games that they play all the time and they'd be very fascinated with this information if presented in a, in a way they could understand because I also think they're lacking in the understanding of that area of um, natural design and faith. Mm -hmm. um, first, I'd invite you to go to intelligentdesign.org. There are some wonderful videos there, like the ones I showed, and um, videos that explain what intelligent design is, what DNA and RNA and protein are, uh, all of that stuff. And um, that's a really, really good place to start because it's visual and that helps a lot. Um, there, if you go to Discovery Institute, they do have some resources for teaching intelligent design, but I would caution you because it is from a Protestant organization. It's not gonna have the Catholic slant that we do. Mm -hmm. um, it's our hope that Catholics will take this on board and become interested in it and allow it into the schools. Right now, a lot of schools won't allow it. I myself have spoken at a couple of schools, but um, uh, it's not a common thing to get invited. I think this would be something, uh, especially as we see the homeschooling movement get much, much more developed. Uh, I just heard that for instance, in some places where they allow people to go to other schools than the public school, uh, you know, it's sometimes it's 20 percent of the population send their kids elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, we need to, to find ways to have these resources made available. Um, and I'll be at a family conference myself in Wichita in, uh, I think, uh, August. And that, that's something I'm going to look for, see if they've got some of that. We have another caller. Hello, Lawrence. Yes. Uh, You're calling from the great state of New Mexico? Yes. Uh, I have a question about the Big Bang Theory. There's a group of theologians, I guess they call themselves theistic viewpoint, and they say the Big Bang Theory is consistent with the realistic view in Genesis. But then there's another group 
that say that if you accept the Big Bang Theory, it makes God uh, the maker and not the creator. Would you comment on this uh, discussion? Um, otherwise, I really enjoy your discussion. It's wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Um, creationists hold to a strictly literal interpretation of the first chapters of Genesis. Mm -hmm. um, and they say that we were, the universe was made in uh, six 24 hour days. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why they would say that it, it turns God into a maker rather than a creator. I, I think what's going on is that they say, well, there was uh, a, the Big Bang and God just formed what banged. <laughs> That's, no, they, they yeah. it just formed the explosion, whereas a creator makes the, uh, uh, the, the universe out of nothing. Well, that's a difference in their understanding. They don't understand what the Big Bang is, which yes. is the sudden appearance of everything, space, time, everything. Before the Big Bang, there was no space. There was no time. There was nothing. Nothing. And nothing. anybody who says you can create... Uh, the universe out of um, the law of gravity is, you know, a law is a law. It's not nothing. Yeah. It's an organizational principle. And um, so the Big Bang says there was, everything came from nothing. That sounds a lot like Genesis to me. Yeah, yeah. It really is creation. So. Uh, uh, ex nihilo or out of nothing. Mm -hmm. And that's what, um, intelligent design recognizes everything came from nothing and that means that whoever the intelligent agent is who made the Big Bang he had to be outside of time and and outside of the universe because they didn't even exist yeah there was no universe to exist there was only God only God and at one moment there was nothing and in the next moment there was everything yep and, and when we talk about an explosion, it, it's, you're talking about a mass of pure energy, pure, pure light that was really very small. Yeah. The whole universe pinpoint. was a pinpoint. Mm -hmm. I, to imagine that God created a pinpoint and that all of the matter in the present universe was there was in that pinpoint. Mm -hmm. I remember, uh, I'd read a very old book uh, that said it was about the size of a, of a, a baseball. Well, but it was- We grew from there. Yeah, yeah. And, but then the explosion took place and it's, but by principles of gravity and uh, attraction of the nuclear uh, centers and such, uh, it's just, um, and the speed of light all of those came forth from the original creation, the laws and the constants, and all of that came forth. And forth. with that, too, it's fascinating because in that Big Bang, at a pinpoint where everything was, it was light. And that sounds an awful like Genesis chapter 1, verse 3. Vayomer Elohim yehi or vayehi or. God said, let there be light, and, and there was, was light. light. It's remarkable that science has shown that that happened. <laughs> Let's get to another call. We have Charles in Florida calling. Charles, what can we do for you this evening? Uh, you know, Father Mitch, I watch other channels on television, and they mm -hmm. talk about extraterrestrials, you know. Now, between you and, and, and Dr. Gager, <laughs> Can you tell me, like, what's the possibility of all these little green, these little ET fellows flying around in UFOs and visiting us? And is it, is it possible that there's extraterrestrial life? Is it consistent with with, cash, with Catholic uh, theology? Can First of all, I would say ETs running around. It depends on the existence of Hollywood. Now, life on other planets. If there is life on other planets, it would have to have been created by God. Yeah. 
it's not something that evolved and then would come here and seed Earth with um, life. Um, that's one of the reasons why the theory called, um, well, I can't think of the name, but the theory is that um, we are the product of alien civilizations that started us here. Um, that's not possible because where did the aliens come from? Now, it doesn't mean that there couldn't be aliens. Mm -hmm. God could have made aliens, um, but it wouldn't happen without him because, uh, first of all, habitable planets are scarce, and um, second, um, it requires a unique creation on his part. Yeah. And because, the, again, the design for life would be so complex. I, I would say this. A lot of people ask us to uh, accept, you know, as a almost a doctrine of, of their teaching, that there is life everywhere. There. It's just logical that there has to be. I think we have to say, let's take a look at the evidence. If we meet them, they exist. Until we meet them, we have to say, we don't know. Mm -hmm. We just have to be agnostic about them, not about God. We have uh, Eva in San Bernardino, California. Real quickly, Eva, what, what's your question? Hi, Dr. Uh, Mitch. I just want, to, want you to know that I really enjoy your show. And um, I, I have a question for Dr. Geiger. Um, the question is, how did these structures that you were showing on video get discovered? Are they visible through an electron microscope? And is that how they were discovered? Mm. Um, Thank you. Great. A good question. Um, so it varies with each one. Some of them are visible on the electron microscope um, to a partial degree. Some of them were identified um, by um, looking at movement in the cell. The kinesin, for example, um, was first detected as an ability to move mi microtubules, and then they identified what protein was responsible and worked out all of the kinetics of, of the walking, et cetera. Um, the uh, topo isomerase was discovered because it was realized there had to be something doing that. It was a necessity. Mm -hmm. And so they looked for, um, they narrowed it down bit by bit to identify an activity, meaning that function in the cell. And they, they purified it and then demonstrated that that particular protein was what was involved. Actually, it'd have to be, um, I think it'd have to have several subunits to, yeah. to get it to work. Yeah. And so the, thank you for that. And again, as part of humans craving to know and figuring out how to view and come to these conclusions. Unfortunately, one conclusion we have to come to is that we've run out of time. I uh, want to again mention this book is called God's Grandeur, The Catholic Case for Intelligent Design. It's edited uh, and uh, contributed by Dr. Ann Gager, uh, our guest tonight. You can get it at EWTNRC.com, where it is item number 8601. 8601. I really enjoyed it. I want to thank you for coming all this way from out in Seattle area to be with us and want to thank all of you and bless you. May almighty God bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you to lead you to understand all his ways and to give him glory. May almighty God bless you, the father, the son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You know, this is a, a, a topic fascinating for me, and we can present this to you only because this network is presented to you by you. Mother was inspired by our Lord to have you present it instead of advertisers. So please remember to keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill, and we will pay all of our bills too. 
God bless you all and thank you. Thank you. You good?